All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our uh, very popular Rev War Revelries, our uh, Sunday night uh, historian happy hours. Uh, today, we are very honored to have uh, the foremost knowledgeable expert uh, on Joseph, Dr. Joseph Warren, uh, Christian Despigna. Um, he is uh, the, uh, of course, author of Founding Martyr, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, The American Revolution's Lost Hero. Um, he is the executive director of the Dr. Warren Foundation and the vice chairman for the Revolution 250th Committee of Massachusetts Freemasons. Uh, he also serves on the board of Bunker Hill Monument Association, and I think he sleeps in between uh, some of those duties as well. But uh, Christian, uh, thank you for joining us here tonight. Uh, very great to actually have you on here and ready to discuss one of this most popular founding fathers. Now, you guys finally invited me after so many years, so I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Well, it took a while to get through your agent. We had to try to lay uh, yeah, agent and true. Jason, so. Yeah, and also I want to say, too, uh, one of the nicest people in this community of, of Rev War historians. So um, I thank you. For, thank you so no, much. You really, you, you really are. You've always been very helpful to us, and we appreciate that. And thanks for coming on. And as we're starting to gear up for, I know Joseph Warren's story is much bigger than the Boston Tea Party. I know that. But we're kind of gearing up for the Boston Tea Party 250th coming up. And Phil and I will be up there in Boston in December. Um, just kind of start off just broadly. I mean, we'll talk about your book in a little in a few minutes. What what drew you to this story? What drew you to Warren and, and the history of Warren and his importance in the revolution? You know, I, I had always, for some reason, when I was a kid, I read, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I was just fascinated by the whole mystique of Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. I don't know why, maybe because I was a night owl back then as well, but I was just always so intrigued by it. And, um, you know, I'd come across a, a 19th century book that was written on Warren and I had, you know, you just heard whispers of his name, a sentence here, a sentence there, but I had read this book and I thought, man, is it possible that this guy did, did everything that this book is is claiming he did and it just kind of developed from there and then um I was lucky enough to uh get a great mentor uh during my uh, college years who really supported the work and I did my senior thesis when I was an undergraduate at Columbia University under Dr. Eric Foner <laughs> and he really encouraged me and and kind of pushed me along and slapped me on the wrist when I needed it and uh taught me a lot. And, you know, it was just, it was just so great. And then he said, Hey, you really need to write the biography on this guy. And then 20 years later, the, we got lucky and a publisher was interested and uh, the rest is history. Hmm. So um, one more Phil, if you don't mind, I'll follow up with that. So uh, I'm just going to start off just basic. So what is his, what's his background? What's his, you know, what's his lineage? Um, we know he's a doctor, but a doctor of what? So what, what's his upbringing look like, his family look like to kind of set the stage here for what he does later on? Yeah, I think that was one of the issues with, with the, the literature that was out there, because, you know, the, there were pieces that claim he was like high social status and had come from a very uh, wealthy, prominent family. Others, it was like, well, no, not so much. And it was kind of like, well, I guess the big question was, you know, how does he become what he becomes in such a short period of time, given his age, given his background, really the background is, is really humble beginnings, right? It's almost like the rags, the riches, American stereotypical story. It's uh, he comes from a humble farming family. They live in Roxbury. His father's an apple farmer. He's also a selectman. So I wouldn't say they're on the bottom of the social wrong there. There is some social standing there, but nothing like, you know, a Royal official or a wealthy merchant or anything like that. And, um, I think they have about 80 acres in Roxbury, which is just right on the outskirts of the town of Boston at that time. And uh, they work real hard. I mean, I mean, I think that was one of the issues with some of the war in literature that so many articles, books, publications were about his political career. Nobody really kind of dug deep enough into the early years. And you realize that his whole rise to prominence is really because of his education. He, he goes to Harvard College in 55 and Tragedy strikes the family. His father's killed in an accident when he's um, picking apples <laughs> uh, at the height of the apple harvest, apple harvest in October, falls from a ladder, breaks his neck, dies instantly. And this is really the pivotal moment because Reese. Warren becomes the patriarch of the Warren family at this point, Joseph. He's the oldest of the four sons. His mother is there. His father's gone. And he is wanting to stay on the farm and help the mom and the family. And uh, she insists he goes back to pursue his education. She borrows a ton of money to get him there to do it. And, and uh, you know, that it, again, if there was 
one moment we could pinpoint that was just such a pivotal moment in his life. It's 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 that October seventeen fifty five. Hmm. Wow, that's crazy. I mean, I didn't know he didn't know his dad died that way, just falling off a ladder. That's yeah. Oh, it's crazy. They uh, so is he? I mean, is it Harvard? Uh, I got this question a lot when I worked at uh, uh with George Washington at the birthplace. Like, when was that moment that Warren starts to turn from a like a colonist? that's loyal to the British to like starting to seep into maybe there's a separation that's needed. You know, I, I don't know if there's any particular moment. I, I think that what makes him so appealing to both patriots and loyalists is that he is so well connected on both sides, right? He's got a strong relationship with Thomas Hutchinson. Thomas Hutchinson had helped the family settle the probate estate of his dad He's getting a lot of financial patronage from royal officials, and it almost doesn't make sense as to why he would join with the Patriots, because it really is kind of financial suicide. And you think, you know, a lot of pages and pages of his medical ledgers, he's treating a lot of prominent uh, royal officials, a lot of loyalists, but he's also treating a lot of um, Patriots, a lot of slaves, a lot of ship captains, a lot of sailors, a lot of merchants, um, you know, every rung of that social ladder. But um you could see things really kind of start to progress. I mean, you know, again, he he's involved in everything. It's it, it's 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 unbelievable. But you could just see the tide starting to turn, starting to turn. But he still maintains these connections. I mean, he, you know, I always say this. He has a foot on each side of the political divide, and that's why I think both sides really wanted to claim him as their own. So you know, I, I really couldn't pinpoint one particular moment. But but if I had to give a you know, a time, I would say probably, you know, early 1770s, you know, when the, you know, John Adams, John, John Hancock, they're all dropping out of this patriot movement, talking about, you know, leave me alone in retirement, and they don't want to be involved in political affairs. And it's really the one two punch of uh, Samuel Adams and Joseph Warren that that keep this movement pushing forward. And I don't want to uh, jump the gun, uh, uh, no pun intended or whatnot. But uh, it's, it's always amazed me that Warren's one of the only ones that remains in Boston for so long. And that's maybe because he is so well connected. It's, uh, it's always amazed me that Warren is not arrested and he's literally operating underneath the nose of uh, the Royal officials. So maybe it's because of the, that keeping one foot on either side. Yeah. I, I think there's a bunch of reasons. I think it's because he's, um, he's obviously smart, very charismatic. I mean, he's a physician. So and I think that's kind of the push pull about his legacy that we, you know, we always remember him as this fighting general and, you know, that famous quote, I hope I die up to my knees in blood. But, you know, the ironic part is that for his adult life, he's he spent as a healing physician, right, saving lives, not taking them. And, and so I think that he has a really um, great reputation as not only a healer, but someone who's fair um someone again you know i can't underscore that enough someone very well connected on both sides of the political aisle so i you know again it's just you know he really is a a, a unique i'm gonna say a unicorn at this time that he you know that he really um you know i always you know the one catchphrase i i like to add is he's doing it all right voice pen sword and scalpel so i mean he really is doing it all i mean and that's not an exaggeration i mean that that's that's really an objective look at the history if you just look at all the things he was involved with and was able to accomplish in such a short period so so um let's go back talk about sons of liberty a little bit and his involvement with the sons of liberty in boston or just that boston kind of underground so you know reading about him and a little bit i know about him it's like he seems to be like the the ringleader of a lot of these different groups what what about him makes him that way i mean i know he has a charismatic personality he's well liked but it takes a special person, right, to to do to do, you know, not just keep get people inspired, but also get them organized, right, and kind of work, you know, in an underground way to to you know push different you know uh, efforts across the city. So, what about him drew people to him as a leader? Well, I think if you, if we can almost kind of look at it as a Venn diagram, you know, I'll mention right before the call we were talking about the book Paul Revere's Ride. And David Hackett Fisher does an incredible job about talking about the historiography of Paul Revere's legacy. But at the end, he has this sort of a chart that mentions all these organizations in and around Boston at the time. And the two guys who were involved in all the organizations are Paul Revere and Dr. Joseph Warren. 
So again, he's involved with the Sons of Liberty, right? The North End Caucus. Uh, he's a Freemason. And I think that's one aspect that has really been under-researched is Warren's role as a Freemason and what the Freemason's role was within this movement. I mean, you know, we can get to the Green Dragon Tavern and all that a little bit later on if you want to hit that. But, you know, I think that's one thing that people who are not Masons have maybe a hard time understanding how important that organization was and that when Warren leaves Harvard, he leaves his social oasis and he goes back to Roxbury and becomes a teacher at his alma mater in, in Roxbury. But he gravitates to the world of Freemasonry. And this is where he meets guys like Paul Revere and, and John Hancock. And again, he just keeps expanding his social circle. He becomes a prominent physician. He saves, you know, over 100 people during the smallpox inoculations. He really becomes one of the heroes of the town at this time. And, and, and people begin to know who he is and know that, you know, he's someone who will put people in his care and take care of them. And he's, you know, deliver, he's performing obstetrical care. This is a new thing in the colonies at this time, right? It's handled by midwives. So really he's got a foot in all these Venn diagrams. And when it just all comes together, you, you can just see how the stars align. And, you know, I know that's not crazily descriptive, but <laughs> when you see all the organizations that he's involved with, it, it, it really does start to make sense that you say, yeah, this, this guy is the mover and the shaker and people are looking up to him. And for his age, he accepts an incredible amount of responsibility and, and handles it well. I'm going to follow up with that. I know we're not, not here to talk about Freemasonry, but you brought it up. It's a great thing to bring up. I know you, you're an expert in this, too. What is it about the Freemasons that um, the men you just mentioned, like, gets the revolutionary spirit, right? Like, what what is it about that organization? In so many ways, you find a lot of the patriots, a lot of the leaders of this movement and Freemasonry. Why do you think that is? What? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert, so let me correct you there. No, you're an expert. Well, <laughs> no, compared, I'm not, to, but... compared to me and Phil, you're an expert. How's that? <laughs> you know, okay. Well, well, I, I think, you know, at the time, you know, Freemasonry is getting a hold, you know, in Boston. I, you know, I think it was 1733. And when Warren first joins, it's 1761. And, and at that time, it was really a fraternal organization that, mm -hmm that extolled the virtue, uh, republicanism, and, and charity. So, you know, it was something that men gravitated to, to help one another, to, to be active in the community. And this is what they're doing today. I mean, you know, the Freemasons now, they raise $3 billion right. a year annually for charity. And, and when right. you see this sense of community, when you're in these meetings, and I'm a Freemason up in Massachusetts, you know, I was honored that to become part of that organization. And you know, when, when you see what they do and you see the traditions and, and the same things they're doing that they would have done 200, 250 years ago, the traditions, the symbolism, it, it really is inspiring when you really, I mean, look, every organization has their issues and members who aren't great, but but when you weed through all that and you see the work they do at the end of the day and how active they are in the communities, it, it's, it's really inspiring to think that Warren was the grand master at that time. You, you don't realize the responsibility and the honor of that position within the community. So, you know, that, that basically meant that he was, he was the top notch guy, right? Everybody's looking to him. And, you know, and this is something that Samuel Adams was not a member of. So again, you know, I'm not detracting anything away from Samuel Adams, but we do have to shift a little of the spotlight onto Warren because he is involved in some more organizations than Samuel Adams. And Joseph Warren, being a Freemason in, in Boston at that time, has a lot more connections within that organization, obviously. And, and, it's, and it's a very important leadership role that really does underpin a lot of these revolutionary events and puts Warren at the forefront of them. Yeah, it almost, it almost legitimizes him in a way, right, with these connections, right? It makes him a, a credible person to kind of lead the effort. So, A hundred percent. Yeah. I had a uh, question for you, Chris, uh, and on that, so Warren's pretty young when he does join the Freemasons, correct? Yes. And, and everything. Um, and so uh, just uh, maybe a silly question, but uh, since we're treating this like we're sitting around a bar, this would be the time when someone's nice. getting on a second or third shot or so. But uh, the uh, <laughs> wow, that, this quick <laughs> 15 minutes in. I mean, it's end of happy hour, right? Uh, get them in. We're all cheap. We're historians. Um, but uh 
is so the Freemasons, you can be any strat of society, correct? Or is there a certain, like, I mean, landed elite or so? So that might add a little bit to that republicanism or like that uh, where your natural talent kind of lets you rise to the top or am i speaking out of turn no you're you're spot on phil and i, and I gotta tell you i was talking I, I have developed some very close relationships with 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 some of the brothers up in massachusetts even though ironically i live in virginia and one of the things we often talk about is like we never would have crossed paths if it wasn't for freemasonry like you know one guy could be a plumber and someone else is working for the federal government or, you know, whatever, whatever it might be, but it just brings a real uh, amalgam of men together uh, within the fraternity. And, and I think that was very important because, you know, I've always wondered why does Paul Revere sort of fall off the face of things really, you know, why is 75 his moment of glory? And then really after that, you don't really hear too much about him, obviously, you know, his business, the bells, the copper mill, and, you know, then he's court-martialed. I mean, but I really think that one of the things is that because Warren comes from those humble beginnings, he doesn't have any kind of, you know, snotty airs about him, right? He's not looking his nose down on Revere for being a mechanic because he, because he comes from a humble beginning himself, whereas, you know, maybe some of the more foppish characters or, you know, fellows with their noses up in the air who are looking at the lower sort, because let's not forget, right, Boston really is a very uh, socially stratified society at that time. And, and Revere is not educated and he is a mechanic, even though he's a silversmith. But I think that Warren really does, you know, open a lot of doors for Revere. And then once Warren dies, I think that conduit to the upper echelon of uh, Patriots kind of closes off in a sense. And it kind of leaves Revere. I don't want to say out in the cold, but I, I think it's one thing definitely to look at and maybe deserves a little more study and attention as to what happens really to Revere after that. So, but, but you're spot on about that, that it does bring a, a whole group of men from all different backgrounds together. And, and when you're in those lodges and you're, you're in those rooms doing the traditional ceremonies and, and, and lodge work, it, it, you know, that that's one of the reasons they wear gloves is because you don't see the other person's hands and maybe they're calloused or anything like that. So, I mean, it's just, that there's a reason for a lot of the things they do and, and it, and it really does make sense. And it really isn't a egalitarian um, organization, which is rare at that time. And uh, I do have to share this comment on, uh, on that point about Revere. Uh, Christopher Jenkins just solved it for us. It's because Longfellow didn't write a poem about the rest <laughs> of Revere's life. There it is. It's <laughs> there you go. Blame the poet um, and everything. So, um, <laughs> well, isn't that usually the case? So, blame the yeah. poet. <laughs> blame the poet. Yeah. Um, but no, it's just it's yeah it's and yeah because you it, it kind of builds on that American like the theme of self-made man. I mean, coming from uh, I mean, apple orchard. If you, if you want to uh, cross pollinate, it's uh, Warren and apples are like Washington and a cherry tree. I mean, it's all it takes is a fruit tree to. Uh, Put out the good values. So there I'm going to steal that, Phil. All right. So be warned. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. Warren never told a lie either, right? That he uh, might have bent the truth. <laughs> not. Never, never told a lie. So, so we get uh, Warren, and then, but as he's successful in in his uh, personal life, one of the things I liked about uh, the book and um, and so forth is also the personal side because he is raising a family at at the the same time, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, you know, in a couple of days, uh, we're going to mark the anniversary of his marriage to Elizabeth Hutan. And, um, you know, he's married when he's 23. This is right after the 1764 smallpox epidemic kind of fizzles out. And uh, she's a uh, wealthy uh, heiress. You know, I think she's one of the most eligible bachelors in Boston at the time. I, I think a lot of there's been some finger pointing that he marries her for financial gain. I completely dispute that. They they have four children. Um, you know, Warren is in the midst of building his medical practice, a home. I mean, I think we kind of tend to forget that sometimes that, you know, you almost look at Warren as this like marble statue, but maybe now he can finally start to exhale a little bit and take a breath and show the more human side and not just the political and 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 show that, you know, he he lost a child in infancy himself and his wife. You know, he loses his wife, you know, after he's been married for about nine years. She dies in 1773. So he's going through all that heartbreak and the pangs of loss. And I think, you know, since we're keeping the Revere theme here going, I think that's what bonds these guys because they both lose their fathers as teenagers. Warren's a few years younger than Revere when he loses his father. I think Warren was 14. Revere, I think, was 18. You know, they both come from these humble backgrounds. 
Um, they both know what it is to experience losing a child. Um, and they both lose their wives within the same week. Okay. And they're both Freemasons. So again, you know, th these common things bind them together, not just the relationship as, as Masons. So there is definitely that personal side to Warren, which I think makes the story even more heartbreaking after he dies, when you realize all these factors and, and what's happened. I mean, he's building a mansion estate in West Boston in the 1770s, doing all these custom construction upgrades. Like, you know, you have to realize, you know, just like anyone today, he's trying to build his business. He's trying to make money. He's trying to raise a family. So, you know, I think sometimes we, we can tend to forget the, the human side of him because there has been so little information that survives. So there's the Washington connection again. Warren marries up. George marries up, so it just continues. So, <laughs> right, yeah. uh, any, any smart man marries up, Phil. Uh, <laughs> that's what I need to do. Um, so, uh, I know I did. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, I'm with you. Spoken like wise men here, the wise men council. So. Uh, as we've been talking about the Tea Party anniversary coming up, what what role? Just kind of you know, thirty thousand foot level here. What role is Warren serving? Um, you know, in 1773 and, and 1772, leading up to this, to this similar event, you know, I think a lot of times we think of Warren, we think of Bunker Hill, right? But we kind of forget the role he has. He's just as important as Sam Adams, Paul Revere on, you know, in April of 75. But what kind of role is, is he serving in um, leading up to, to the, to the tea, the tea controversy in Boston? Right. Yeah, so we know that he's very involved in the massacre, right? He shows up on the scene that night if we're starting in 1770. Um, he's performing autopsies, you know, on the wounded. And uh, I mean, he's helping the wounded performing autopsies on the dead. He's one of three men appointed to write that short narrative of a hard massacre of Boston, where they're collecting almost 100 depositions to get that propaganda coup over to Britain. So he this is where he really starts his political rise. It's really him and Samuel Adams forming the committees of correspondence. And this is at a time when we see those letters again from John Adams saying, you know, Warren was the one beckoning me to come to the, the political clubs and meetings above the Green Dragon Tavern. I have you know, that way madness lies. And so, you know, you, again, it's, it's Warren Adams pushing that radical agenda and really, you know, you know, come 1773, when, when, when they find out um, about the whole tea fiasco and what's happening with the East India Tea Company, because of Warren's position with all those connections, they're using him as one of the bargaining chips. They're sending him to have meetings, you know, he's having meetings with, um, you know, he's speaking with John Rowe and um, Clark, who's one of the tea consignees. So again, all these tea consignees, right? The Hutchinsons, the Clarks, these are either medical patients of his, former classmates, friends, associates. So again, he's right in the center of this political storm and they're using him to try and negotiate. And so we know on that night, you know, after he's having all these meetings, you know, and and let me add this, two of the owners of those tea ships, Richard Clark, John Rowe, John Rowe is a brother of Warren's, even though it's from St. John's Lodge and Warren is a member of St. Andrew's Lodge, but also um, Francis Roch is the owner of the, one of the owners of the tea ship, he's Warren's patient. So again, you know, we also forget that Warren owns one of the wharves on, you know, in, in the port city of Boston, it's called Hutan's Wharf, he inherits it with his wife, from his father-in-law. So again, he's very connected to the seaside population, right? He's got buildings along the wharf, he's collecting rents, he's moving and shaking down along the wharves. And again, you know, he's not this like prissy aristocratic guy. He can relate to the lower sorts and he knows how to talk to people. So again, he's part of this seafaring population. So with all these connections and being used as a bargaining chip, he's there at Old South Meeting House that night. Now, this is one of the problems I've had with the narrative of the Tea Party is that, you know, let's define what we mean by Tea Party participant. You know, we're not suggesting that Warren was on the Eleanor, the Beaver, the Dartmouth throwing chests of tea overboard, but to think that he was not one of the main organizers planning this, I mean, it's just naive. He's at Old South right. that night, you know, when the meeting concludes and they all go down to the wharf, I mean, it's just ridiculous to think that Warren decides, yeah, I'm going to go home and, you know, start a fire. You know, again, I'm not saying he's on the <laughs> ship, but, you know, he his fingerprints are all over the event. And so, you know, even years later, the, you know, there's sketches of the Green Dragon Tavern that talk about where we met to plan the consignment of the tea. They have a meeting that day 
on December 16th at the lodge at the Green Dragon Tavern. And it said they, they didn't have a quorum to have the meeting, but it says that the tea business took up the, the, the lion's share of the brother's time. So again, there's all these clues. And when you piece them all together, you realize that Warren is one of the main organizers of this event. There's even a ballad that surfaces year later that talks about, you know, all Warren's there and bold revere with words to do and hands to cheer. And it's, it's a whole... So again, you know, when, when you put all the pieces of evidence together, when you look at these tea party lists and you see how many of the participants were actually Masons, I've been doing research on <laughs> Warren's patient list to see how many of these people on this list were connected to Warren in some way. It's, it's just, it's just kind of mind blowing. And it's, and you realize, wow, th this guy really was one of the main orchestrators of this event. And it's just a shame because and not that he has to get credit, but, you know, to say he wasn't involved just because he, you know, he didn't have a hatchet breaking open a chest of tea and throwing some tea leaves in the harbor. I, again, it's just a naive view. No, I, I've always seen, I've, I got this image in my mind, obviously it's my own image, but like Warren, Sam Adams, they're there, like you said, at South Meeting, and then as the, the crowd goes down to the you know, Griffin's Wharf, they... Uh, I see them leaving the situation to kind of not be connected, even though they, you know, they, they maneuvered all this thing behind, behind the scenes, but to keep themselves above the fray of it, they, they removed themselves from it, even though, yes, they planned it. They were involved. They, you know what I mean? They I think it was like a strategic, I've always seen it as a strategic decision by them to not be on the wharf. Right. right? Uh, yeah. That's just my, that's my personal take on it. It's like, oh. you know, because that's where the British, I mean, our officials probably would want them to be on the wharf, right? I mean, it's that's when they're breaking in or so forth. It's having them connected. Um, I, I do have to build on Rob's point, though, real quick, but it's not as fanciful. I always view Sam Adams and uh, Warren as, um, I'm going to use the 1990s cartoon uh, uh, Animaniacs, Pinky and the Brain. They're the brain, oh and uh, the guys on the wharf are Pinky because they're the one organizing everything, and they're part of it. You need them, but they understand that they are a bigger pitcher. So they're trying to take over. Um, I think Brain says every night we're trying same thing we try to do every day, try to take over the world. Oh, wow. Um, so trying to stay young here, Rob, with the pinky. I, the brain. I, this is our to... first time in three years that pinking the brain has ever come up on one of these. So hey, there it is. Uh, Christian, I, I apologize. <laughs> it's better than talking about that other war that sometimes creeps in. So. No, don't do that. Yeah, see, I kept don't out of that, that. But no. <laughs> and, and is it he's the speaker that night at the old South Meaning House, isn't he? His isn't he in the dressed in the in the toga and, and all that? No, not the not the toga. That was that was the 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 massacre orations. But but I mean he's there along with Samuel Adams and Thomas Young and, and and some of the heavy hitters. But you know again I look. Let's be honest. Unless there were video cameras there at the time, like this was so <laughs> shrouded in secrecy. Like we could sit here all night. I mean, but if you just start to take the pieces of evidence that exist, right? And by evidence, we don't mean facts, we mean information. And if you start putting together all the pieces of the puzzle and you say, okay, this guy's involved in every major event, you know, leading up to it. And then right after that, and he's a member of all these organizations that are involved in this event. And he's there at Old South that night. And there's information from these minutes of the Masonic meetings that they're talking about this. And he's having the meetings with Richard Clark you know, who's one of the tea consignees before that. And that was the whole issue where they were trying to get Clark to appear. And, you know, after he speaks with Hutchinson and, and to then say that, yeah, he wasn't involved in any of this. Again, it's just kind of ludicrous to even go there. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, he does everything and he's the end all. No, I mean, because you really want to try and be objective and not subjective about it. But but, you know, there's no doubt that he, again, he was one of the main organizers. I mean, he's not just going to hit the pause button and, like we said, go home and, you know, make a fire and swill some rum while all this is going on. Yeah. And it's, I mean, you alluded to it earlier. I mean, he's, he knows the people in the wharfs. He knows, he's got the vibe. So, I mean, like, it's one of those, like, um, where there's smoke, there's fire. I mean, type thing. So, um, we may not, we're never going to have facts. We're never going to have a video camera saying this and that. Because a lot of these guys did take it to their grave. Right. Um, and so forth but i mean if you point that all the th his hands are in so many pies as you said that um it'd be more shocking that he wasn't involved exactly. in some aspect of right. one i mean then being involved so exactly. um you but, mentioned um i i wasn't aware of the uh, that uh his ownership of the war one of the wharfs in boston so kind of in, in tune with that he had a lot to lose by being involved in all this right i mean 
you know, lot, he had a lot financially to, to lose if this whole thing goes south. Um, much more involved than just being a doctor, not, not just a doctor, but, you know, he's, he's got financial commitments that are going to be heavily impacted by, you know, when they close down the harbor. Well, not only that, I mean, you know, look, it's easy for us to look back now from that 21st century lens and be like, well, he wasn't arrested or, you know, they, you know, they didn't hang him for treason. Okay. But who knew that at the time, nobody really knew what was going on or what was going to happen or who was on this London's enemies list or, you know, again, look, just to, to point one thing out when he delivers that second Boston massacreation on March 6th of 1775, he volunteers to do it. And they're, they're threatening, the British soldier are threatening to assassinate anyone who delivers that oration. So again, you know, we're not even talking about standing to lose financially, you know, standing to lose his life. You know, what, what's that famous quote by Franklin? And, you know, if we don't hang together, we most assuredly will all hang separately. I mean, you know, that, that doesn't just apply to Philadelphia post, you know, 1776. I mean, that, Really, these guys, I mean, if you look at it, you know, they, they, you know, you know, I always say this, where are the founders at this time, right? Where are they in 1775? Are they in Boston? Are they, are they the on the ground leaders? No, I mean, it's really Warren, who's the mover and the shaker here. So again, I mean, he has everything to lose. And, and the, and the tragic, tragic part is he does lose everything. You know, I, I mean, he pays the ultimate price on the battlefield. And then it's his family that suffers the horrific consequences after that. And I mean, and you're talking about even if he's not even on a list. I mean, you look at like a James Otis, who just is spousing some at the wrong time and gets uh, whacked across the head uh, by Brit. I mean, so it's not like a it's you don't know who's who in Boston that could. I mean, yeah, so it's a, it's a stress, stressful time all to begin with. Someone once also mentioned that he probably has. Um, maybe not as merely as much as John Hancock, but he does have much more to lose than, say, a Sam Adams, who's always one step above, I mean, not being in debtor's prison or whatnot, right. I mean, and so forth. So um, <laughs> it's that's something, I mean, it, it, we take for granted that, like, oh, these guys um, were doing it for selflessness, and they were, but they also had to live, eat, feed their kids, survive. I mean, and that's just... Yeah something that gets fallen by the wayside. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, we, we even know that Warren loans, not loans, gives Samuel Adams money along with about uh, 20 other guys back in uh, the late 1760s to help get him out of that tax that he falls in. I think he gives him about 24 pounds. So again, you know, Warren is helping, you know, he's helping his, his brothers in arms and he's helping his comrades, his political comrades, his friends, his, you know, I, I always joke around about this when I get when I give a talk on Warren, and I'll say, how many people here have seen the the series Little House on the Prairie? You know, and it's usually an older crowd. He's too young. He's, you know, you're too young, Phil, to probably remember this. But, <laughs> I but watched the, it in reruns, I promise. Okay, exactly. But, you know, remember the Dr. Rob who's, who's you know, the, he comes to see yeah. a patient and they're giving him yeah. like a cage of chickens or something. I mean, that is Warren. You know, you look at his medical ledgers and he's taking beer, shoes flour, chickens in, in the form of payment. He's canceling fees, saying in consideration of this family's misfortune, he's not. So again, he builds this reputation as a, as a generous healer and people are putting themselves, you know, not only in his medical care, but now they're starting to trust his his political advice. And so he really becomes a, you know, a man about town and he, and he rises to become wealthy. And, and, and really, I mean, you can just see from the complete painting, you know, that his clothes, you know, I've seen his tailor bills, like, it, this is all on a level with John Hancock, right, he's, he's ordering the same kind of silk and buttons and ribbons. And he's also, you know, riding around town in a vermilion colored carriage. So again, and John Hancock owns a vermilion colored carriage. So again, you, you see him on an equal social footing now, and, you know, economic footing as Sam, as a uh, John Hancock, who's one of the wealthiest guys in the Bay Colony, and now you're seeing him start to rise on that same equal political footing as a guy like Samuel Adams. And, you know, the shame is, he, you know, Warren always gets kind of, I don't want to say neglected, because I think, you know, in the past, like, you know, couple of decades, like he's been getting some recognition. But, you know, uh, and I think it's also amazing when you think about a guy who dies a year before the Declaration of Independence is signed, never signs that document, never signs the Constitution, but but we're still talking about him. And I mean, I think too. Oh, go ahead, Phil. No, go ahead. I was gonna say because I mean, what amazes me is the. Uh, I'm gonna go on a limb here. 
uh, go out on that uh, apple tree limb uh, for using the metaphor. But uh, Warren, I mean, Warren is the revolution uh, for about a, I mean, when all four of the major uh, signers of the Declaration from Massachusetts go to Philadelphia, he's there. Uh, the one that um, I think two of his greatest exploits is he understands popular opinion. I mean, getting stuff after the Boston Massacre, getting those depositions, getting them out. But also on April 20th, the day after Lexington Concord, getting those people to espouse and getting those primary sources to London to shape that narrative. I mean, that's something you don't even think about um, for thinking. I mean, today, yes, whoever gets it out, breaks the news on Twitter or, or X or um, Facebook or whatever else that shapes popular opinion first. Warren's doing it 200 years ago. You know, so. that's, you know, hence the, the voice pen, sword and scalpel. Right. I mean, yeah. he's, you know, he's delivering the orations, right. He's collecting the depositions. He's conducting the spy ring. I mean, you know, and that's another thing that gets neglected. Right. You know, and, and to the point about the Longfellow poem, you know, I always say, you know, again, not to detract from Paul Revere, but why do we call it Paul Revere's ride? It's it's Joseph Warren's intelligence network that that tips him off that and he sends Revere and Dawes on the ride. And it's Warren, when he hears about the eight militiamen killed on Lexington Green, does he say, all right, I'm going to sit at my desk and write letters to the to my buddies at the Continental Congress in Philly? No. He goes out and he goes to Monotomy, modern day Arlington, and he's almost killed when that musket ball knocks out his hairpin. So, you know, again, I also think there's this aura of invincibility that starts to envelop Warren, you know, where, where he shows up in battle, right? I mean, you know, he had no business being there. He had no business being at Grapes Island, Noddles Island, Bunker Hill, Lex Concord. You know, so again, these militia units, the, these people are seeing this guy of... You know, he's at the top spheres of the social, economic and political standings in the Bay Colony. And then he's showing up to fight like a like like a soldier or, or a militiaman. It's I mean, it, it, the, the, the notion is kind of ludicrous. I mean, you know, think about it. we know Washington did. it. I think that's one of the reasons people love and admire Washington so much with all the bullet holes in his coat and his cloak and his hat and, you know, having horse shot out from under him. And we have that famous quote from Washington, right, where he says, you know, there was something charming about the bullets <laughs> risen by him, you know? So it's like, it's kind of the same thing when, you know, you really see that, there's, you know, there's, there's so many similarities that connect these individuals and their stories and the history. Uh, I'm going to follow up with the, after the tea party, the course of acts are passed. Someone just asked us a question, I think ties in with this. So you see a lot of the, the leaders of the Whig movement in Boston leave Boston. Um, why does Warren stay behind and what did he do with his family? Did the family stay in Boston? Did he ship them out? What, why does he stay in town other than the reason to get information? But it's a dangerous time for him to stay there. Right. You know, I don't know if, the, you know, look, I would love to sit here and say, you know, Warren was elected as a delegate to the Continental Congress and turned it away. We don't know. I mean, but we do know he stays there. So, right, they passed the, you know, the Coercive Acts. We know the Boston Port Act takes effect June 1st, 74. We know that in early September, he's drafting the Suffolk Resolves, right? The Declaration of Rights and Grievances against the British. It's calling for armed resistance. It's calling about stockpiling weapons, ammunition, okay? So as things, this is where things really start to heat up now. So, you know, as we get into 75, Lex and Concord, the spy ring, what he does is, and again, when, you know, we're looking at this from an 18th century mindset, not the 21st century, there's no guarantees. You know, the, what, what is the guarantee that they're not going to come arrest Warren, take his family, seize his possessions? You know, they don't know at this point, right? We know he delivers the fiery oration in 75. We've heard about the story with the British musket balls in the hand of the soldier, the threats. I mean, you know, so again, he sends, he sends his, at this point, he's engaged to a woman named Mercy Scully, and he sends her and his four children out to a farm in Worcester, Massachusetts, under the care and protection of a friend of his, Dr. Elijah Dix. So we have some letters that he's writing to Dix, you know, in the spring of 75, talking about him buying him more farmland because he wants to spend the next year involving himself in agricultural pursuits, which kind of falls in the face of people saying, well, he went out to fight in Bunker Hill in a blood rage and he wanted to die. I mean, come on. 
I mean, the guy's got four kids. He's got a, he's, he's 34 years old at that time. You know, he's not looking to get killed. I mean, right. they don't, you know, that day at Bunker Hill, nobody knows what's going to happen. There's no guarantee that the British are going to make that assault charge of Breed's Hill and, and the fighting is going to start. You know, we, we don't know this at this time. They don't know that this this time. We know this now, but when he rides out there, I mean, he's putting it all on the line. So you were talking about Lexington. We have to we have to ask the question. You know what it's going to be, right? I think yeah. so. You know what it's going to be, right? So who is his informant? Okay, so on, let, <laughs> let's let's put the rest who we know is not the informant. Okay, and this was disproven <laughs> by J. L. Bell, who runs that great blog, Boston seventeen seventy five. And you know, I think this started. You know, I think there was a mention of it in the in the David Hackett Fisher book, The Poor Viewers Right, about the whole yeah. Gage thing. And, you know, I, I guess the reason and TV that took it off, right? TV went off with it. Crazy. <laughs> you know, that horrible series from a few years ago. Oh, man. I mean, you know, I think, they were. No, they, they, I guess they had sensationalizing it. I don't know. But we know for a fact it wasn't Margaret Kemble Gage. I mean, as much right. as we can know. I mean, they were not involved in any kind of sexual relationship. I mean, you know, I think there was some clues that maybe made people think that. But but on the flip side of that, you know, the, the excuse was, well, he gets so angry and sends her back to London. Well, he did that. They had children after that. They didn't get separated or divorced. There's no animosity. I mean, I have some ideas as to who I think it could have been. You know, one possibility is um, Lucy Knox. I mean, so uh, her father, obviously the royal secretary, third highest position in the royal colony, she marries Henry Knox, and Warren's medical office is on the same block as Henry Knox's bookshop at one point, Warren Hill Street. Henry Knox's mentor, a guy by the name of Nicholas Bowes, is a good friend of Warren, loans Warren some money, and Warren's treating the Flucker family for three years back in the 1760s and is treating Lucy when she was a girl. So it's very possible that the person maybe feeding some of that information was Lucy Knox. Um, but again, you know, we, we, let's let's also remember, can I mention this, that Warren's spy ring is predating Nathan Hale, George Washington, Secret Six. Right. And when Washington arrives in Cambridge in July of 75, you know, there's already a whole Patriot spy network set up for him waiting there. So again, we know that the informant was not Margaret Kemble Gage, but we do know the, the the famous quote that it was a daughter of liberty unequally yoked in the point of politics. So I, I mean, it's anyone's <laughs> guess, but let, let's put to rest the Margaret Kemble Gage uh, delusion. Good, good. Thank you. We, we put it to rest, but we may have started another one with Lucy Knox. So they... yeah, you know, again, you know, <laughs> I've... I've Hey, I've discussed this with J.L. Bell. He does not think so. I, I love J.L. and I going back and forth on some of these debates. And, you know, you know, again, it's a possibility. You know, again, we're talking about espionage. We're not, you know, there's no roadmap. There's no video cameras. So, so again, this is all speculation based on evidence that we collect. Well, we just appreciate you sharing that to the, the World Wide Web on Emerging Revolutionary War. So we we get we, uh, we break this. So, no, um, I mean, it's quite possible. I've always been fascinated. I mean, how much the Lucy, not to go on that side too too far, but how much she sacrifices for the, the cause and, and everything like that. Because, I mean, she loses a connection to wealth, status, family. Yeah, family, right, exactly. Yeah. And then Henry Knox goes, I'm going off to Ticonderoga, stay with these people for a few months. I may <laughs> may, may not come back to guns. So. Right. <laughs> Yeah, uh, guys, <laughs> he's got to have a commitment outside of him. I mean, so maybe. But. I was gonna, I was gonna fast forward really quick, uh, looking at our time. Um, so, you know, I, I know a lot about Warren's, you know, from your book and just reading in general his involvement leading up to Lexington and Concord. So, why is he there at Breed's Hill? Why is he in a military role? How did he switch from? you know, kind of being the, the head of the spy ring, for lack of a better term, into a military role. Tell us about that transition for him and why do you think he was personally there um, yeah, that day? Yeah, I just think he's wearing a lot of hats at this point, right? He's the physician, he's the patriot, um, you know, and I believe he was offered a um, commission as the uh, surgeon general in the army. Um as one of the head physicians and he, and he declines that and he's nominated as a major general by the provincial congress but you know here's one thing that we often overlook and no one really talks about this is that you know a month before the battle of bunker hill you know when you read the letters between warren and the massachusetts delegates at the um 
Continental Congress, you know, they're really writing to him saying, what's going on? Tell us what's happening. What, what do we need to do? How can we help? Give us an appraisal of the situation there. And he's kind of guiding this hand there. And one of the things he writes them in May of 75 is that you need to appoint like a national army and not these just ragtag militia companies from all the different uh, colonies. And he said, you need to appoint a generalissimo. I mean, and what happens three, four weeks later? You know, they, they form the Continental Army and Washington is appointed as commander in chief. So, I mean, really, Warren is part of, of this creation of the of, of the of the army and, and, and getting a. Uh, a figurehead appointed in the form of uh, George Washington. So again, he's nominated as a major general on June 14th of 1775. He gets word that the battle's happening on June 17th. He rides out, I believe he's in Watertown at the moment. It's been five, six years since I read my book. So um, I'm peeling all this from memory. Well, we know he gets there and we know he first encounters General Israel Putnam. Now, Putnam's a grizzled war vet. He's friends with Warren. He's a generation older than him. Putnam knows he's been appointed as the major general. And what does Putnam do? He says, the command of the field is yours. And what does Warren say? No, I'm here to fight as a volunteer. Let me know where the fighting is going to be the worst. And that's where I'm going to go. He sends him off to Breeze Hill because Putnam's at Bunker Hill at this point. Now, he goes, he, enc he encounters William Prescott, Colonel. Prescott does the same thing. You know, General, the command is yours. Warren says, no, I'm here to fight as a volunteer. Tell me where the action is going to be the worst. So he points him and he goes to the redoubt at Breed's Hill. So again, you know, you have these two grizzled French and Indian war veterans, generation older than Warren, you know, yielding command of the battle to him. I mean, this is an incredible hmm. thing. So it Warren is, goes, yeah. and when he arrives, all the soldiers, all these militiamen start to huzzah him and cheer him because they're thinking, you know, if Warren's here, you know, it almost being if we're in Afghanistan and all of a sudden, you know, the president shows up or United States senator shows up, we think, well, you know, we haven't really been left for dead here. You know, yeah. Warren's here. So, again, the problem I had with a lot of the histories when they're describing this battle and Warren's role in it, they almost... They almost portray him as a cheerleader, right? They say, well, he showed up to rally the troops and motivate them. You know, nonsense. He shows up with pistols, a musket, and a sword. And he's in that redoubt with those men firing at those British soldiers. And I think another thing that people don't remember is that this battle, the Battle of Bunker Hill, produces the most casualties than any other battle throughout the entire American Revolutionary War. And the officer corps of the British are just decimated. It's more than a 50% casualty rate. So again, you know, Warren's not there cheerleading. And what happens on this third assault charge? When the British penetrate those fortified lines, it becomes a blood rage. The British don't know the Patriots have run out of ammunition. They've just been humiliated at Lexington and Concord. Now they're scaling the walls of this redoubt, and we have primary source letters from both sides of the battle talking about the British soldiers taking the butts of their muskets, bashing in the heads of the wounded patriots, stabbing them with their bayonets. There's one sole route of retreat on the road to Cambridge, and Warren is getting all those men to get on that route of retreat. The, the fighting turns to the, you know, almost Neanderthal throwing rocks, they're fighting with their fists. I mean, it's a brutal, brutal engagement. And Warren is killed in the last seconds of the battle when he's shot through the face and he dies immediately. So all those 19th century gilded lily speeches they claim he gave is, is you know, nonsense. I mean, he's killed instantly and he pays the ultimate price on the battlefield that day. And so that uh, fanciful painting of him being struck in the chest is not is not accurate. So, uh, <laughs> no. I mean, but it is it's something too. I mean, there's we take uh, the granted, but that personal exposure, the person being there, uh, not only just rally the troops shows the importance, uh, but I mean, it also um, shows what I mean he means to the uh, once again a common soldier. I mean that her it's like a Washington or so forth. I mean sometimes their uh, lives are worth more just physically being there um, and so forth and and um, admitting to it. Um, so that's but unfortunately you put yourself in harm's way. Eventually your luck could run out. But I mean he's also suffering that day too, isn't he? Like got severe migraines. I think he's uh, like prone in bed and he rises up. So I mean it's. Just takes an effort for him to get to Bunker Hill or Breed's Hill. Right. And and the heat we know was oppressive that day. And I'm trying to imagine myself wearing like 
wool stockings and a vest and a shirt and a, possibly a wig and, and, and riding out miles on a horse and then walking, you know, however far distance up a hill in those, you know, high heel shoes we had from yes. back then. And, you know, I'm just thinking we could sit here and chest pound all we want. And, and I'm thinking, so if I'm in that redoubt and, and I have children at home and my wife had died two years before, I, you know, I think I'm going to be like elbowing people out of the way to get out of there. I mean, <laughs> and, and the fact that he, yeah, and the fact that he stays, I mean, that's why you really have to capture this moment because you think, look at, look at what he did. And, and that's why when Washington shows up two weeks later, because so many people say to me, well, the founders didn't know Joseph Warren. And I say, nonsense. They all knew who he was from the Suffolk Resolves. And when Washington arrives, how could a man of Washington's character, his morals, his ethics, how could he not but admire what, what Warren did on the battlefield? He knew he had four orphan children. How would, how would Washington not emulate this man at this point? And, and let's keep in mind, right? This this is not Yorktown, seventeen eighty one. It's it's Boston, seventy five, and and Washington has to fill Warren's shoes at this point. Nobody knows who Washington is in in Boston. I mean, Good they point. know maybe they know of him, but there's letters from soldiers saying a new general arrived today. His name is Washington. So again, Washington will become Washington. We're not taking anything away from him by any means. But at this moment in time, this 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 grain of sand and this hourglass. This is when everything shifts. This is when it becomes the Warren era to the Washington era. That's a great point because you're right. When Washington arrives, he's got to fill Warren's shoes. Um, never really thought of it that way, but that's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, and it kind of ties into what I was going to ask you. So I'm not going to call him forgotten. I think you call him lost hero. Um, but he's not taught like the Sam Mabs and the Paul Revere's, right? Sam Mabs has a beer. Paul Revere has a poem. Um, why? And and obviously, excuse me, his contemporaries thought very highly of him. Um, I'm here in Virginia with, you know, and, you know, there's Warren County. There's Warrenton, not too far from where I'm living. So, they, you know, in Virginia, they're naming places after this, after this man. But he's not taught that much today. I mean, we could go on about history being taught today in general. But... People know Revere, people know Adams, but not everyone knows Joseph Warren. Why do you think that is? I, I think there's a whole slew of reasons. I mean, when I go give a PowerPoint lecture, the last 20 minutes is spent because I remember early on when the book came out and I was giving the lecture, some guy stood up and, and very politely said, you know, if, if this guy's so as important as you say he is, well, then why isn't he a household name? And I thought, you're right. And so I started answering the questions and there's so many reasons. I mean, you know, I wish we had another hour but, you know, <laughs> one of the main ones is, you know, think about this day, right, at Bunker Hill, okay? So he's killed this day, and the hero, who's the hero in the colonies before this, right? It's British General James Wolfe. So heroes at this time, right, there's no Superman or Flash Gordon. Heroes at this time in the colonies, it's either military or nobility. But now it's Joseph Warren. He becomes the first American martyr, so that now when people say, do you know about Joseph Warren? If people know about him as well, it's like, oh, yeah, he's the guy who gets killed at Bunker Hill. Or, yeah, he's the guy who sends Revere on his midnight ride. So this this one afternoon overshadows 10 years of resistance activity. So all right. the things he's doing up to this point, we wash them aside. And it's like, well, he's the first martyr of American independence. And I think that's the problem, that, that everything else gets washed away. He becomes this kind of hero and... And we don't remember him for so many other things. And really, he's not part of this later triumphalist phase of American history where all his peers and colleagues are going on to become presidents and governors. And, you know, he's kind of left in the shadow at the dawn of this new civilization. I mean, imagine, I mean, uh, the, we love to play the what ifs game, but imagine, I mean, if he does, what what role or <laughs> position he would have got uh, farther in, I mean, after independence. But I mean, you look at guys like him or James Otis, who I think John Adams says, one afternoon advances the cause of revolution a decade um they get i mean die or fall off the scene at the at the pivotal moment but they get it to that pivotal moment so people like washington and so forth can can take it on um but i would say i think with uh if adams has a beer warren should have like a whiskey well, that's both medicinal and non <laughs> so that way it, it folds up so if anyone is listening is looking for a distillery idea warren whiskey kind of it rolls off the tongue right hey, so, so listen we we have a foundation it's called the dr joseph warren foundation and we're working on a documentary we have a trailer we're working with a hollywood producer 
we are talking about all kinds of things. We're talking about the documentary. We're talking about a graphic novel, a comic, potential museum, and uh, a possible beer or alcohol. So we, we are engaging with all these different things, trying to push it forward. So 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 there's more to come. There's a lot more to come. So I was I was going to no, ask not- you about I was going to ask you about the documentary because two people have two people were at. Um, Bruce Vintner's event in Williamsburg this past year where, where we were at too, and they're asking any updates on the documentary. So you just kind of did that. It's yeah. still being worked on. It's well, it's being worked on right now. It's in the hands of two, this is all new lingo for me, two banner companies that have the keys to all the gate holders for the networks in Hollywood. So we're, you know, we're right on the cusp of hearing back. I would say within another week or two, we're going to hear back and see. Oh, wow about it getting into the hands of, of one of these Hollywood executives. And, and look, you know, if we strike out on that and we're going to, we're going to produce it ourselves, like we did the trailer ourselves. And so, you know, I'm very hopeful though, that this, this, this Hollywood producer who's helping us um, is very well connected when he read the book, he loved it. And that's how we got connected with him. Um, So he loves the story. He, He, you know, he loves Warren and he thinks that this is a story that needs to be told as as a lot of the people I speak to, but they believe the same thing. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. there's no reason not to have a 45 half hour documentary about this guy. So, you know, anybody who wants to help us uh, join the cause, we're, we're more than willing to link arms and all cross this finish line together. So, I mean, it's a great story, not just from the sense of a historical perspective, but it's a tragic story too, right? The story of his childhood, the story of his wife, you know, uh, and then of course his ultimate, you know, giving his giving his life for, the, for his cause. That's that. There's tragedy there. Tragedy, unfortunately, sometimes sells better than than the history, right? But <laughs> that's what drives me nuts about the fictional novels and drama because you don't need to fictionalize this story. It has all the high right? drama. And, I mean, it has it all, you know. And just just this post mortem journey, the fact that he's unearthed and reburied like four or five different times, and then. Pictures of his skull are taken in 1855, 50. I mean, the story is just fascinating. I mean, we could, you know, we could stay here till, you know, tomorrow morning talking about it. So, but I know you guys got to muzzle me now. So. I mean, we can have, we can always have you back. We're uh, the Sundays keep on coming. So then, yeah. you guys are great. You know, maybe the next one we do will be in a bar. So there, there it is. Um, we've we've done it before. <laughs> but uh, I was just, I don't want to speak for Rob, but I will speak for Rob here that if you do need people to help test, taste some of that Warren uh, beer or whiskey, uh, we will gladly. Yeah. Um, we are experts on that. Uh, I can yes. the that. first people I'm signing up. <laughs> we are yeah, experts on that. If we'll, we'll do that in honor of Warren. I mean, we will sacrifice <laughs> part of our liver for that. How um, generous of you both. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, um, and on that note, if someone is trying to, um, I mean, uh, any speaking engagements, any talks coming up on Warren that we can pass on if people are listening, trying to get that book signed or, or get it from Listen, you? The best thing I could point them to is our website, which is www.djwf.org. That's the Dr. Joseph Warren Foundation. We're doing a lot of scholarships. Uh, we're doing a lot of commemorative events. You know, we're, we're very involved with the 250 of the Tea Party. We're going to be celebrating the Suffolk Resolves, Lexington and Concord, the Masqueration, Bunker Hill. So there is a lot going on behind the scenes. Uh, I'm not the best front man, I guess, because I'm so busy trying to push these events. So, if, you know, again, if anybody wants to help get involved, learn more information, go to that website. And we'll, we'll put it in the chat, yeah. Phil. I'll do it right now. Perfect. Sure. Put it in the chat because uh, we even have a few people asking already if uh, we can keep us updated uh, on the status of the movie and so forth. Um, yeah, we'll definitely pass on. Um, we'll even if uh, put stuff up on the blog as well as things I, go through. I, so. I'd even give you my cell phone number, and I used to give it out until someone called me at three in the morning asking me warrant questions. And no, I, we're not doing that. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> literally three in the morning. I thought maybe they're in Europe somewhere, and they said, "Oh no, no, we're uh, we're right here in Maryland." So. I, that's, that's that, that sounds like being a native Baltimorean. It does sound actually. Like you know what, Rob? I think it was you, as a matter of fact, wasn't it? At, no. Three a.m. I'm not. It might have been me, but no. Uh, it could have been. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Funny. I mean, walking home from after a successful Orioles game or something. It was there like, you I, go. Got, <laughs> I got a Warren question. So that, yeah. <laughs> well, we put the link in the chat. So anyone watching um, now or on two page later the link is there let let me tip my cap to you guys and all the great work you're doing i mean because you guys i know you're volunteers i don't think you get the credit you deserve and and i think i think you're doing it better than a lot of other people and you're doing some really selfless work here and i know how much time and effort you've put into this and i and i will echo the sentiment 
about you two being really great guys. And, you know, I could sit here and talk to you both for hours. So we are, I am always at your disposal. Anything we can do to help, you know, just, you know, with it. You well, know thank what you. It, so. oh, we, 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 we do it for the same reason. We do it to have a good time and do it because we have a passion for it, right? just for like that. you do as well. So I think that's why it's, it's, it's fun for us to do that. Well, I appreciate so, thank you. That. No, appreciate no, really appreciate it. And I'm thinking he did say we should do it from a bar. What if we did it from the top floor of the Green Dragon? There you I mean, go. <laughs> that would be epic. Now, the well, new one's not where the old one was. That's no, okay. well, we can get into that. But yeah, <laughs> let's do it at the Warren Tavern, even though it's 1780. Hey, you know, my favorite, they, my favorite they, bar up there. Favorite and they have bar. great people over there. I got to give them a big shout out because favorite they, bar. they are so helpful to me and, and the foundation. And, uh, you know, they're that's just, great uh, to hear that. You know, they're, they're really good people. So. Well, and I, we'll definitely have to uh, have you back because we need to continue uh, part two. We barely part scratched two, the surface yeah. on Warren. So, um, but no, we do. Uh, uh, I'll leave, give it over to Rob for closing uh, remarks. But thank you again, Christian, for uh, coming on. Uh, and you, Warren, for uh, or the great book. Um, My it, honor. I need to yeah. read it Check again. Check it out. Um, Check it out. Um, it does show the power, though, of Twitter or X real quick. Cause I think that's where we connected because. Christian came up to me at the conference in Williamsburg goes, Oh, you're Phil. And I went, Oh crap. Like, first <laughs> what did I, I do? <laughs> what did I do? And I think it was a great, he said, I wrote a great review. And I was like, things I, like I was going through a mental checklist of possible like things he could know me about. And that was pretty far down the list. I was so <laughs> very happy. Uh, but no, it was, it was very, uh, very well-deserved uh, review. It's an awesome book. Uh, no, you guys are great too, man. You really are. I, and, and I appreciate this. I appreciate you having me on. It's, it's, it's my pleasure and honor to be on here and, and just talk about Warren and, and, and uh, talk to you guys about it. So. Well, um, kind of follow up here. Our next revelry is in two weeks, September 17th. Uh, Dan Welch of our group will be talking with Dr. Benjamin Karp about his book, Boston Tea Party and the Making of America. It's been out for a while now, but it's a good book on the tea party and kind of just tying in with getting ready for the 250th this December, where hopefully Phil and I will be up there. And, um, you know, with all this stuff we're doing with, with, with the uh, anniversary, hopefully Phil will be fully engaged and fully informed about what's happening. So no big um, deal. You just have the world's leading expert on the tea party coming on the show in two weeks. So, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you we met, how, like, too, met him too at the, you know, at, at, at Bruce's uh, Rev War conference too. A super nice guy. Been very supportive of us too as well. So Ben's uh, a great looking, guy. He's an academic but he's also a down to earth guy. And, yep. you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that's not a slam in anyone, but like Ben is totally approachable. Like, you know, just, just a great guy. I can't say enough things about Ben too. So. Well, well, hopefully everyone watching tonight will join us in two weeks. So thank you everyone for watching. Like I said, uh, see you in two weeks. Keep an eye on our blog. We're doing more blog content right now. And thank you, Christian, for joining us. Appreciate everyone it. Have a good night.